This week, um, I've been trying to sort of seek God on what to do, what to speak about. Or, and um, I kept on getting Ezekiel and different things and different people and different things I was watching or whatever. It just kept on coming up with Ezekiel. And then I looked at the book of Ezekiel and read through it. And I'm like, what is this thing? Um, and I was just like, God, do you want me to get a message out of this? Like, the only one I know is about the dry bones, but that's a bit cliche. You know, um, surely there's something else. Um, but it seems to be keep coming back to that. So we're gonna, I'm gonna have, a, we're gonna have a look through that today. Um, but um, a few days ago, I found my diary um, from 2016, and um, there's this really weird prayer declaration. I don't know what you want to call it. That I wrote out, and I'm gonna read it to you. Um, don't get to hear to get to see what's in people's diaries that often, but you know, here we go. And um, this was written four years ago in July 2016. And um, I think that's what I'm going to do. I think I'm going to read this out and then we'll see what God does after. Okay. Do you want to just shut those the double doors, Joe? Is that all right? They're not going to shut up, are they? now. Twenty years a Christian, what does that mean? Am I a better person than I was? Am I closer to God? Have I made better, more wise choices as I've got older? Do I know where I'm heading? Have I done my very best? Is sin less potent than it used to be? Have I gained more knowledge of the Bible? Do I pray more? Do I express my faith more than ever? Do I help set an example in my faith to my family and to the children and to the church and to the world? Is my faith stronger than it has ever been? Am I proud of my walk with God over 20 years? 20 years ago, if I were to envisage how far along in my faith I have come in 20 years, I'd expect to have been able to say yes to all of these questions. Instead, I find myself saying no. And not in a humble way or with a typical Christian attitude of it's all about Jesus, his grace overflows, I am weak, he is strong, I know all these things. But in all truth, I am disappointed in my efforts to follow Jesus over the past 20 years. Yes, I have good memories, some great testimonies of God's goodness. And some exciting stories of how my obedience to have a go saw some amazing things happen. If this was a school report, I expect it to say some promising moments, but could do better. Richard has shown glimpses of his potential in Christ, but often makes poor choices or gives up easily. He should be more grounded, more knowledgeable, and ready to lead people. Instead, I see wasted potential who could have done much better. But that's just it. Doing better is not a challenge. Anyone can do better. You just have to do one more thing different to yesterday and you've done better. What God requires is our very best. And before you say that's unreasonable or that by doing that, we, ha we are relying on ourselves, not God, let me stop you there. Our best is still nothing compared to God. But God still wants it. Our best is all he asks for, and he takes care of the rest. After all, God deserves the very best of us, surely. He has defeated death and sin. He has secured our 
He has secured our futures. And all at a cost, to him only, freely we've received and freely we must give. So looking back 20 years, yes, I could have done much better, but where I have truly failed is in not giving and doing my best. I've relied on self, I've stayed still for too long, and I've allowed myself to be tempted too often, and I've tried to control God. Our human relationship with our fathers, I believe, brings us to a place of trying to impress, thinking that by ticking boxes and looking like we're doing the right thing, we gain our father's love. That we buy our father's love for us by trying not to disappoint and by doing what we can to impress them. I feel like the men in my life I have that relationship with. And so naturally God, and so naturally God, my true father is the same. But he is not. God loves us no matter what. We fail, um, we fail, he loves us. We succeed, he loves us. He loves everyone no matter what. But I do believe there is a greater blessing in our lives the more we choose his way rather than the way the world, of the world. I've failed to give God my very best. And that has put me in a place today of uncertainty where my faith is challenged and my purpose lost. I am not a patient person. I do not wait on God. I want, expect it all now. And that is not true Christianity. Waiting is a big part. Growing is a big part. And patience and peace are needed. I feel like a mediocre Christian. Somebody who lives like the lukewarm church, living two lives, but committing to neither one of them. Being a Christian is to be like Jesus. To learn to live like him. To be involved in miracles. To have endless testimonies of God's greatness in our lives. I don't do that or have it in my life. I'm distracted easily, discouraged too quickly, and make little effort to engage with people. I am at a crossroads. Do I sell for what I am and what I am doing, or do I start giving God my best? Sorry, I turned into Jess. Man, I wrote that in July 2016. I'm at a crossroads. And I believe the church today is at a crossroads. I believe the church is not giving God its best. I believe Christians are not giving God their best. It's not a high standard. It's not perfection, it's not excellence, it's just the best that you can do. I looked at my life, I looked at how I lived my life, and I just thought, yeah, I've got testimony, yes, I've done things, but has God got my very best? Does God get your very best? Does he? Does he get the dregs? Does he get what's left over? I'm at a crossroads. The church is at a crossroads. People in this room, you're at a crossroads. Now you can carry on living the way you want to live. You can carry on doing what you want to do. You can carry on accepting a lukewarm way of living. Or you can just start giving God your best. After I wrote this, I don't know how long after, maybe a week or so, I knocked on Ian's door and I said, things need to change. The church needs to change. I want to be part of that if you want me to be part of it or we need to go, me and my family, we need to go and we need to do it somewhere else. Do you want my help? Or not. 
And he said, yes. That was four years ago, July 2016, after I wrote this. I, do I have given God my best in those four years? No. But have I tried to live by that? Yes. Has God got my best at more times than not? I think so. Do you know that bit I read out as I was reading it just to you guys? Being a Christian is to be like Jesus, to learn to live like him, to be involved in miracles, to have endless testimonies of God's greatness in our lives. It says, I don't do that or have that in my life, but I do today. I do today, miracle after miracle, are we seeing God move in this place through you, through my life as well. I see God moving in my life testimonies of God's goodness I want more I want to see God move more I want to see more things happen but if anyone wants that it was just a choice it was just a choice I'm at a crossroads ownership own your sin own it I'm a sinner and I'm falling short and I'm not where God wants me to be. Instead of dressing it up, instead of saying it's okay, God is a gracious God, he's a good God, it's okay. Like Margie said, that we just keep going back to the same pit that God keeps getting us out of. That we own it and we just say, no, I don't want to live that way anymore. It's literally that quick a crossroads of a decision that you can make. I don't need to go that way anymore. I don't need to live that way anymore. And I believe today God wants to stir his church. You see, Anne was crying out earlier. The thing is, the church, if we want to see God move, no matter what kind of uh, history you look at regarding revival, it starts with you. You want to see it? Or do you want to be part of it? Do you want to be a observer or do you want to be a participant do you want to be involved then choose him choose him choose to give him your best in every area and where you fall short when you're struggling just say maybe I'm just not giving God my best in that area maybe that's why I wrote at the bottom, the church has abandoned its first love. That was four years ago. I'm going to share later a little bit of a, um, a word that I felt God gave me for the church in our nation. But I want to go through this passage with you. I think today is an important day for the church, our church. I don't really want to talk about any other church anymore. We're responsible. You're responsible. It's on us. Give him your best. Okay. I wasn't expecting to cry. Sorry. A bit awkward, isn't it? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can you hear it? Turn to the person next to you and say, can you hear it? Can you hear it? Um, and if you've got your Bibles, turn to Ezekiel 37. Just a disclaimer. Just a disclaimer. Ezekiel 37, I do know, is about Israel, Okay. That's my disclaimer, that's it. However, I believe God gave me a word through this passage about the state of the church. Um, not just today, I think I had it about three or four years ago. I remember sharing it with Amelia when we were gathering and praying together um, as a church, churches at the time, um, for God to move through uh, evangelism at the time. I believe this is about the church right now. We also know it's a prophecy to come. Right. 
verse 1. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord. And he set me down in the midst of a valley. Man. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord. And he set me down in the midst of the valley. Okay, the first thing I just want to bring out of this. Sometimes we look at valleys as the worst place possible. Yeah? You know when you chat to some Christians sometimes... And you say, well, how's it going? I haven't seen you for a while. Or what? And they'll be like, oh, I'm going through a season right now. I'm just in the valley. Or sometimes you'll visit a visit in church and you'll say, how's things going in the church? And they'll go, oh, well, we're just through the valley right now. We're just going through the valley. But it's like a real downer. As if like we're here. We don't really want to be here, but we're here. You know, it's all Satan's fault or something like that. But you know, we look at valleys as a negative thing. But... It says in this passage, the spirit of the Lord set me down in the midst of a valley. And it also says he leads us through the valley. You know, in, in Psalm, what was, thank you. Um, he, set, he leads us through the valley. God leads us through valleys. Valleys are necessary for our walk with God. And they're not actually a negative thing. They're a really positive thing. And actually, you probably spend more of your time in valleys than you do on mountaintops. Because valleys is where we grow. Valleys is where we strengthen. Valleys is where we get to know God in a more intimate way. When we're on the mountaintop, we're just loving it. We're like, we're hey, party time. We love that. But actually, when we're in the valley, we're seeking God. We're growing on our relationship with God. So if you're a person that sees a valley as a negative thing, then you're going to be stuck in there a long time because God's trying to teach you a lesson. But if you understand that you're in the valley for a purpose, a reason, and that God has led you into it and you acknowledge it, you'll get out of it a lot quicker. You'll get out of it a lot quicker once God's done the purpose um, through it in you. So I encourage you, don't see ne- uh, valleys as a negative thing, but actually as the place that we spend most of our life with God but it's a great place. It's the place where we spend time with the Lord. It's a time where we grow in our faith. To the person next to you, can you hear it? Can you hear it? And it was full of bones. And he caused me to pass by them all around. And behold, there were very many in the open valley. When I read this, I was grieved. Because when you read this passage, it says it's full of bones. And he caused me to pass by them all around. And behold, there were very many in an open valley. Do you know that if you really are a Christian, your faith is not hidden. It's seen by everyone. Now, you can be a Christian that does nothing, but you use that term. You go around saying, I'm a Christian. You are then in the spotlight for the rest of your life. The example you set, what you look like, is irrelevant Everyone sees it. When she put that title, oh, I'm a Christian, people just have it. I'm a Christian because I'm British. I'm a Christian because I go to church every week. But actually, you don't want that title. Do not put that title on you if you ain't ready for it. Because to be a Christian is to be like Christ. That's a high standard. And everyone will be looking at you to see whether you're meeting that standard. But this grieved me because... I I believe this is about the church right now. And the valley was full of bones, dry bones, dead bones, just there, the church. But it's an open valley because everyone can see it. Everyone can see these bones. And that is what the world sees right now is is a valley full of bones, a church in a valley, open valley that everyone can see and it's dead and it's dry. It grieved me because when I related it to how I feel, the, where the state of the church is right now, that is what the world is seeing. It's not seeing faith. It's not seeing love. It's not seeing compassion. It's not seeing miracles. It's not seeing people stepping out and praying for the sick people that are dying in this world right now. It's not seeing any of those things. There's no spark. There's no life. It's just a pile of bones. And that is what the world sees. It's what the world will say it saw this church do during the 2020 pandemic, one of the worst times that in our nation that we ever went through. They'll say, where was the church? They'll say, oh yeah, it's in the other valley. That's the bones that you can see there. That's what it looks like because we are out there to be examined and everyone can see us and that is what the world sees. The, the world is looking for hope. The hope that doesn't disappoint. You remember that one? The hope that doesn't disappoint. 
And all it sees is dry bones. So many dry bones that it fills up this valley. Can you hear it? Can you hear it? Next verse. And indeed, they were very dry. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? I believe this. I'm going to read this out. Before the world can receive the gospel of Jesus Christ, it needs to see a church living out that gospel that we're trying to sell them. How can we go out and talk about Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, the one that's given us a, a spirit of love, peace, and a sound mind, not of fear, and actually go out there and portray the very opposite? The church needs to understand it has such a responsibility on it right now. And it has all eyes looking to it. How are you going to stand? How is the church standing? What does it look like? This is so important. I was chatting to some people this week. And I was saying as much as we can go out on the streets and preach the gospel... If there is not a church that lives out this faith in the way that we should be, in loving one another, serving one another, being expressive in our love for God. I was chatting to another person this week and they were saying, isn't it amazing that the conversations that you have are just all about God now? You see, the world that will come in, they need to see Christ. They need to see Jesus in and through. This can't be a fake. This can't be, this can't be something that they come in and it's a show. It has to be real. It has to be genuine. It has to be raw. You have to have a pastor that's willing to cry. You know? Um, but you, it has to be a mess. We're a work in progress. Are we not? Yeah, we're a mess. So we want to show the world that we're still a mess. We're still a mess, but we just got Jesus. And we can show you that it works. This thing that we're telling you you need, that can set you free, change your life, take you away from that sin, rescue you from, from hell, it works. It works. Come and see. Come and see. Come and meet my brothers and my sisters because it works. I can show you. It's evidence. Look. Look at Petronella. She's got the Holy Spirit. You see it? Look at Monica. Come and meet my sisters. Come and meet them. We need to understand that standing for Jesus, being a light in this world right now, is more important than ever. This is not when we become the lamp sign that gets hidden under the bed that no one can see. This is the time that we become the light on the hill that everybody sees. I know um, that maybe some Christians have been dry, struggling to see what is possible. Maybe you're here today, maybe you're online, and you feel really dry. You cannot find a way out. You struggle to remember your first love and what it was like to have the power of God flowing through you. Well, today, you're at a crossroads. And today, you can just say, I don't want to be dry anymore. I don't want to do that anymore. I want to do my best for God. I want to live my best for God. If you're dry right now, God can breathe life into you today. What's also interesting in this passage, he said, can these bones live? Ezekiel answers, oh Lord God, you know. Now let's understand the context of what Ezekiel is looking at here. Because obviously he, he doesn't really answer the question. But I think when you look at the state of the bones in the valley, now scientifically, I don't know about you, if I had a bone here right now, it's just a bone. You have a load of bones in the valley. It's a lot of bones in the valley. It's just bones. There's no life in it. There's no flesh on it. It's just dead. Ezekiel is looking at this picture and God is asking him, can they live? Can these bones live? And he's like, well, you know, because uh, to me, no. No. No, it is impossible for that to live. Who, who was ever impossible? Who was an ever impossible case that, that, that actually... That, that, that you would look at now, back on, you said that, that was like 
a bone that had no life. And it was impossible for anything to happen with that. That was me. That was me. Oh, you know God. You know. Because to me, I can't be saved. Yeah, who had that one? I can't be saved. I'm not worthy. Suddenly, it's impossible. We look at it, it's impossible. You know, only you know God. Because to me, no. Scientifically impossible. And maybe right now, some of us as Christians are looking at the state of the church and we're thinking it's impossible. It's a valley of dry bones. And it's impossible for them to live. Maybe that's where we're at right now. God's looking. He's asking you the question. He's not asking you, can you make them live? He's asking you, can they live? Or how will you do it? Can they live? Can these bones live today maybe there are dry bones in this very place or listening online and you are dry bones right now you need to start realizing that God's asking the question can they can they live can you hear it turn to the person next to you say can you hear it can you hear it can you hear it (laughs) he keeps repeating me (laughs) Verse 4, again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. To prophesy means to speak or to sing. By inspiration, a prediction of what is to come. You know that song, what's the song? Um, what's the song? The, the <laughs> There's always one in there. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a classic. <laughs> what's the song? Um, it's so good, it's so good. I'd be so proud if that was me. Um, <laughs> there's an army rising up what's that song yeah so there is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain that's a song it's a song and it's prophecy it's prophecy thanks Mark thanks a lot <laughs> I was trying to usher in revival we've just gone the other way now haven't we so the revival of 2021 got stopped we'll get to heaven God say oh it was going to happen until that uh, yeah we've got a lot to answer for <laughs> to prophesy is to speak to sing by inspiration a prediction of what is to come there's power in the name of Jesus to break every chain there's an army rising up these are prophecies these are songs that you've been singing have you been singing them as prophecies or have you been singing them because you like the tune There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. We are prophesying this, are we not? Do we believe it? We need to start prophesying. We need to start speaking over our families, our neighbors, the strangers that we've never met. People that are in pain and going through sicknesses and illnesses. And we need to start saying, in the name of Jesus, be healed. In the name of Jesus, be set free. In the name of Jesus, demons get out. In the name of Jesus, we need to start prophesying and we need to start believing that these bones can live. Just prophesy. What's dry in your life right now? Who is dry in your life right now? Who's out there that's dry in their walk with God or maybe they don't even know God and, they, and you know that they need God? Prophesy life into them speak life sing life into them turn to the person next to you say can you hear it can you hear it so I prophesied as I was commanded and I prophesied and there was a noise 
Should we make a noise? Can you do a noise? Do you remember at school when you used to pat your legs? Let's do that. And there was a noise and a suddenly a rattling and the bones came together, bone to bone. Can you hear it? Can you hear it? I think George is embarrassed to pat his legs. Come on, George. Let's watch him. There he is. Right, okay. Just checking. I saw it. You can stop. You can stop. But can you hear it? You see, you see, sometimes we're listening for something grand. We're looking for something. But if we just listen, we might hear the sound of the rattling. We might hear the sound of the bones coming bone to bone, starting to form. Remember, this is a scientific impossibility. This does not actually happen in real life. I don't think it does anyway. Have you seen that? Anyone? No? Okay. It doesn't happen. Okay, so these things are starting to happen because why? Because you prophesied to them. Bones come alive. Come alive. Suddenly, a a rattling. Bones came together, bone to bone. Can we hear it? Can we hear it? Because this is what really matters. It's not about whether we see it. It's about whether we can hear it. It's about whether we can actually start believing that this is something that God can do. Because we already know there's a valley of dry bones. We may be those dry bones personally right now. Or there may be areas of our life that are dry, that need God. We, can, we know that. But it's impossible, as far as we're concerned, for it to change. Unless we start speaking life into the areas of our life that need it. And the areas of other people's lives, or our nation, the government, whatever it might be, can you hear it? Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Some people for too long have been trying to operate as a Christian without the breath. Too many people have been trying to operate without the breath. That is why you're dry. That is why the church is dry and dead today. Because it's been operating without the breath. You need the breath. The breath is the Holy Spirit. The Ruach of God. The breath of God. That is what's been lacking in the church. That's what's been missing from our lives. From the church's life. You want to know who gives us a, a spirit of peace, love and a sound mind and not a spirit of fear? The Holy Spirit. And what's right now claiming the church? Fear. Because it's not operating under the right spirit. It's operating under the spirit of fear. That's not God's spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit. It's something completely different. And that is the driver of many Christians today. Many churches today. But they need the Ruach. They need the breath. Because right now they're just a a body now. They're not bones anymore, but they're a body. But it has no breath in it. But there was no breath in them. This nation needs the wind. This nation needs the roar of the Holy Spirit to fill its life. Can you hear it? Can you hear it? You see, in the uh, Pentecost, it was like a rushing wind. They heard it. And it set the church on fire. Can you hear it? You want to know why you're dry? Ask the Holy Spirit. Ask him where he is in your life right now. Can you hear it? Where is he? Where is he, the Holy Spirit, in your life? Where is he in the church? Is he allowed in? Is he invited? And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of men, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. That 
is got to be, has got to be our prayer for revival. Our prayer for revival has to be, Lord, we prophesy breath on this nation, on this estate, on this city. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these that are slain that they may live. We need to start speaking in to the lives, into this government, into this nation. Lord, breathe your Holy Spirit into their lives that they would no longer be slain, but they would live. People are dying today. I don't mean they're dying from a virus. They're dying from sin. They are, sin is consuming them, controlling them. And if they end up actually losing their lives, they're actually condemned by that very sin. That is where we're at right now. And the church has the answers. The church has the power of the Holy Spirit living in them. That you, we can go out there and we can go and speak life into these people. And they would no longer have to be ruled by sin. But they can be set free from the life that they're about, that's about to end. That's about to go the wrong way. And they can be set from it, free from it and be given life. Revival. I see revival, I believe in revival, but it starts with you, it starts with me, it starts with where we're at. Are we desperate for God? Are we desperate for souls? Are we willing to prophesy to the breath? Are we willing to ask the Holy Spirit to move like never before on our nation? Are we willing to ask the Holy Spirit to come into our lives like never before, that he would invade every part of us. It's time for the church to rise up. That's you and me. If you are not part of God's family, the church, today's the day you can come into the kingdom of God. Turn away from your sin. Choose him. Let him set you free. Fill you with his breath and give you new life. We're at a crossroads. Does anyone want to say goodbye? What did I say? <laughs> it's time to say goodbye to what was and to choose life. Or are we dry and we're happy to stay there? Or do you want to give God your best? I'm at a crossroads again. It's four years on. I'm still at a crossroads, always at crossroads. Do I keep going with God? Do I keep living for him? Do I keep giving, keep giving him my best? Or do I stay still? Do I stay where I am? Do I get stale? Do we get dry? I want to challenge you today that if you're in a place right now and you know that you're at a crossroads and you know you haven't been as serious with your faith as you should, today's the day. There's no condemnation in this place. No one's going to be looking down on you. No one's going to come up to you and say, tell me about the last 20 years then. Was, what was yours? Like Rich? Because he was really bad. Did you hear his? So, you know, like, no one, no, it's between you and God. Like it was between me and God 20 years ago. Do I want to live this way where I am right now? Do I want to settle for this? Or do I want to do something with my life for God? Do I want to live for Jesus like he lived for me? Just choose life today. Choose to let God change you. Let God challenge you in, this, in, in, the, in these times right now. I think we're in serious times. I'm going to show you show the word that God gave me for the church um, now. Um, but it was given to me a similar time to the first bit that I read out earlier. But I read this through this week. I, it blew my mind about what God has done already. There's still more to come. I'm not, just to let you know, I'm not a prophet or anything, just so in case you get a bit weirded out by that. But... I have a relationship with God and I feel like sometimes he speaks and sometimes it's good to write it down. And so I did. I'm going to share this with you. Every now and then I might just say to you, can you hear it? Maybe turn to your neighbor and say the same when we do. Here we go. This was written on the 15th of July, 2016. I am calling my church back to me in this nation. I am going to waken my church, breathe life into it, and ignite the hearts of my people. 
I will soften hearts which have been hard. People will start to have a sudden, sudden hunger for my word. They will become prayer ambassadors. They will seek and use the gifts of the Spirit. And drawing my people back to a heart of worship. I want to inhabit the praises of my people. Love one another as I love you. Fix your differences quickly and with a heart of love and encouragement. I am removing the critical spirit in the church. Do not involve yourself in gossip or idle chatter. Instead, make a stand and pray into the situation. Be a lifter of people, not a destroyer. Stand with your leaders and trust their choices. These people often spend a lot of time in prayer, discussion, and study when making choices. Leaders, I am calling you to make a stand. Unite and stand by your calling. For my church to be effective to the world, it needs to reflect me. And the only way that can happen is if you spend time with me, study me, and worship me. If all my church were to do this together, it would change this nation. I can do exceedingly, abundantly, above what you can ask, seek, or imagine. Do not limit me. Do not let past mistakes, failures, and hurts control your faith in me. If I say yes, no one can say no. Do you hear it? Tell the neighbor. You will have a new building. <laughs> you will have a new building because you know the cost involved. Not money, but the spiritual cost, the sacrifice, and the waiting. It will be done. This church will grow. You will see miracles. You will live out daily testimonies of my goodness and mercy. Just to put that in context, I was working out this week. Of all the adults that are in this place right now, there was only 11 people heard this in 2016 that are here today. Just, there you go. Live out daily testimonies of my goodness and mercy. Hill fields will be the light on a hill. No longer will your light be hidden, but it will shine for all to see. I am calling my church to fight for this nation, to hunger for the lost. Go and make disciples in my name. My spirit is going to transform this estate. He is hovering, waiting for my instruction, and then the lights will be switched on. As I move, so too will the works of my enemy. But do not fear. Remember, I have not given you a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. Be at peace. Remember, there is power in my name to transform any situation, no matter how hopeless it seems. But first, repent. You have abandoned your first love, me. Remember where you have fallen from. Repent and get back on track. A repentant church will be illuminated, but an unrepentant church will have its lampstand removed. Seek first my kingdom and all these things will be added to you. Draw near to me and I will draw near to you. I hear the cries of the people. I see their suffering and their affliction. They are slaves to this world and they suffer for it. It is time for the church to deliver my message of hope through their lives. I am going to rescue people through you. Those who call on my name shall be saved. I am going to take them out of the miry clay and set them on the rock. I am that rock. I will not be shaken. Do you hear it? Tell your neighbor. This is a new season in this nation, on this estate, for I am about to do something new. Do you not see it? Because it's already begun. I am going to make a way in the wilderness and I'm going to bring rivers of life to the dry land. It is time, church, to rise up, shake off the dust and take hold of your position. I am about to breathe life back into your life. You have been but dry bones in a valley collecting dust. But here comes the breath of my spirit from the four winds. It's time to rise up. Come to life, church. The world needs you. And they stood upon their feet a vast army. I don't see anyone standing. I don't see any. And they stood upon their feet a vast army. Are you ready? Do you hear it? Do you hear it? Do you understand? It's you. 
It's our responsibility. We can look at the state of the church and we look at that valley and it's impossible. But actually, God is calling you to do your best. Stop focusing on what other people aren't doing and start focusing on what am I doing or not doing. Am I giving my best? It is the way I'm living my life, giving every chance to the souls that do not know him, that they may know him through how I live my life, how I speak, how I, how I operate, how I conduct myself, through my example, how I live. They stood upon their feet a vast army. There's a little picture there, Rob. Can you put it on? I think I might echo if you put it on. It's on the GFX. Okay. This is a picture I sent to the church. Um, when I, in August 2016, I shared this, that very prophecy or message or whatever word with the church. That's what the state, this is what the church looked like. I put every chair out that we had. And I spoke about filling every single one of these chairs. And I said to the church, do you see it? I remember saying it to them. There's only 11 people in the church today, adults in the church today. Do you see it? Do you know some people didn't see it? They actually left the church because they didn't see it. Do you see it? Do you know last week, every one of these chairs was filled? Every one of them. Praise God. Every one of them. But I want to encourage you because over those four years, people just came and went. They just left because they didn't see it. But I'm asking you not whether you see it, but do you hear it? Can you start hearing the bones rattling? Can you start hearing the prophecies that you're praying over your families, your loved ones, your neighbors, your work colleagues? That you suddenly start to see life starting to rise up in them. That the breath is coming. It's on its way. The Holy Spirit is on his way. He's going to breathe life into his church, into you, into those that do not know him. It's coming, but do you hear it? Our kids are starting to assemble. It's starting to come. You're starting to hear the bones crunching and coming together. It's starting to happen. It's starting to happen. See, today, when we look at that, that picture and it says, do you see it? And we look at that. Now, today, we don't need to see anything because you just use your eyes and it's right in front of you. You don't need to see something that's not there. It's right there. It's right there, right here. It's happened. It's happened. That, it's happened. It's happened. It's done. Yeah? So now, can we hear it? It's coming. More's coming. God's going to do more. God's going to do more. Hi guys, thanks for watching this video. Please go and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please um, go and like our Facebook page and please share um, this video with your friends and your family. Um, let the world know more about who Jesus really is. Thanks guys.